Lecture 8, Editing the Rich and Famous. Just to show no one's perfect, kick the clay feet of our gods, and otherwise make ourselves feel better through the mistakes of others, for this last lecture, I'll be reviewing some of the concepts we've covered through the lens of popular prose. To be clear, these are not bad writers. Well, not all of them. I'll let you decide who's who. And these are also not random passages. I had to look for them. But let's dive in. As I said in Lecture 2, typos happen to everyone, much more so in the pre-digital age, when a printer would have to take a typed or handwritten manuscript and set each letter for the press. An excellent example of this is James Joyce's originally self-published novel, Ulysses. He wrote the epic tale of Stephen Dedalus and Co. in what's been called illegible longhand, using a steel pen. Then, he added 100,000 words to the page proofs, also by hand. And oh yeah, the French typesetters who put this all together didn't speak English. Joyce was so troubled by the sloppy results that the first edition had an insert reading, The publisher asks the reader's indulgence for typographical errors unavoidable in the exceptional circumstances. A three-volume edition of Ulysses, released in 1984, corrected 5,000 omissions, transpositions, and other errors, including things like The paper the beard was wrapped in Which should have been The paper the bread was wrapped in And Wait would he feel it if something was removed? Which became weight or size of it, something blacker than the dark. Wonder would he feel it if something was removed? Feel a gap. Literary critics bending over backwards to make sense of some of his prose, and hey, that's half the fun, found themselves saying things like, oh, it was bread. I should also note that a lot of these 1984 corrections have since been challenged, but not as far as I know, the bread. Complex and highly open to interpretation to begin with, Joyce is a unique case. Sometimes it's hard to pay attention. Sometimes you just don't. Beyond typos, there are also outright errors. In Robinson Crusoe from 1719 by Daniel Defoe, Crusoe strips naked and swims out to his sinking ship and carries supplies back to shore by shoving them in his pockets. You know, no pants, no pockets. In Robert Heinlein's Stranger in a Strange Land from 1961, one character's name repeatedly switches from Agnes to Alice, which, really, someone should have caught. Likewise, shifts in tense most likely occur because someone's not paying attention. As in this example from Stephanie Mayer's Twilight. I couldn't decide if his face was beautiful or not. I suppose the features were perfect. As we know from the lecture on tense, it should either be I can't decide if his face is beautiful or not. I suppose the features are perfect. Or I couldn't decide if his face was beautiful or not. I supposed the features were perfect. Then there are those passages that seem to have been proofread, yet still leave something to be desired. This one, from page 424 of Stephen King's It, is more a question of clarity. Eddie handed him the bottle. Stan took two, hesitated, then took another. He gave the bottle back and swallowed the pills, one after another, grimacing. Then he went on with his story. Read it twice and it makes sense, but on first read, Stan took two makes it sound like he's already taken the pills, while he's only putting them in his hand, making it a bit confusing when he then swallows them one after another. A clearer version might be, Eddie handed him the bottle. Stan shook out two pills, hesitated, then shook out another. He gave the bottle back and swallowed them one at a time, grimacing. Then he went on with his story. When it comes to overuse, back in Lecture 3, I mentioned my reaction to George R.R. R. Martin's use of wicker in Game of Thrones. And to be fair, I went back and checked. Turns out he only used it seven times in hundreds of pages. Now that may not seem like a lot, but to me it was an unusual word, so it stood out and took me out of the moment. In one scene, I couldn't unsee it. Moving on to redundancy, specifically of the contextual variety, here's another passage from Stephen King's It. This one on page 147. He lost it and made a hissing sound of disgust between his teeth. What's the contextual redundancy? Well, who here can make a hissing sound that isn't between your teeth? I know I can't. It's akin to writing, he spoke using his mouth. Here's a similar example from J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, listed at dysfunctionalliteracy.com. It's an invisibility cloak, said Ron, a look of awe on his face. Putting aside that being awed by an invisibility cloak is arguably redundant itself, where else would the look of awe be but on his face? Now let's get a bit more complicated with...
Here's another bit from Harry Potter, this one from The Deathly Hallows, page 85. Ron and Hermione gave roars of outrage, but Harry said nothing. He pushed the newspaper away. He did not want to read any more. He knew what it would say. Nobody but those who had been on top of the tower when Dumbledore died knew who had really killed him. And, as Rita Skeeter had already told the Wizarding World, Harry had been seen running from the place moments after Dumbledore had fallen. The first sentence is probably fine, but the uncommon usage of gave makes it feel a bit clunky, at least to my American ears. In any case, what's wrong with Ron and Hermione roared with outrage? Beyond the needlessly complex use of a colon and semicolon, the second sentence also has a bit of redundancy with the phrases, he pushed the newspaper away, he did not want to read anymore. Why else would he push the newspaper away? Making those changes gives us, Ron and Hermione roared with outrage, but Harry said nothing. He pushed the newspaper away. He knew what it would say. What follows is a fairly packed run-on sentence, which, among other things, repeats Dumbledore's demise with died and killed. Splitting that in two and getting rid of the repetition gives us... Nobody but those who'd been there when Dumbledore fell from the top of the tower knew who had really killed him. As Rita Skeeter had already told the Wizarding World, Harry had been seen running from the place moments after. According to several sites, this one is from the Twilight fanfiction turned novel Fifty Shades of Grey. I downloaded the novel and searched a few online versions to check, but mysteriously couldn't find it. Maybe the edition has been updated or whatever. In any case, I think this awkward description of taking a shot in pool is worth a look. I line up the white ball and with a swift, clean stroke, hit the center ball of the triangle square on with such force that a striped ball spins and plunges into the top right pocket. I've scattered the rest of the balls. The first issue to get technical is that given the subject, I, this reads as if I hit the center ball, rather than the white ball, with a swift, clean stroke, rather than the white ball hitting the center ball. To be fair, in baseball, you would say, I hit the ball rather than the bat. But here, given the rest of the sentence, it only adds to the confusion. For instance, on first read, I wondered what a triangle square was before realizing the full phrase was square on. In terms of the grammar, that's if not totally legit, close enough. But using a word that also means a geometric shape right after a word that does mean a geometric shape, muddies things. From triangle, the mind naturally goes to square as a shape, rather than a direction. The geometry issue continues. You can't hit the center, or eight ball, dead or square, on, since it's surrounded by other balls. I assume the author meant the head of the triangle, also known as the one ball. Lastly, the rest of the balls would scatter as a result of the same hit of the white ball, but the phrasing, I've scattered, makes it sound like an additional, rather than simultaneous action. The tense also shifts from the present of line up, hit, plunges, to the past, with scattered. It's certainly fine to have a character who hasn't played pool before not know that the white ball is called the cue ball, but the action itself can certainly be clarified, as in this revision. I line up the white ball and send it off with a swift, clean stroke. It hits the head of the triangle dead on with such force that, as the rest of the balls scatter, a striped ball spins and plunges into the top right pocket. For our final passage, let's take a look at another from Fifty Shades' spiritual parent, Twilight. This one from page 45 of the Kindle edition. Do you mind if I look? He asked as I began to remove the slide. His hand caught mine to stop me, as he asked. His fingers were ice cold like he'd been holding them in a snowdrift before class. But that wasn't why I jerked my hand away so quickly. When he touched me, it stung my hand as if an electric current had passed through us. As with the previous passage, the author is trying to describe a few things that happen at the same time, or in rapid succession. As she starts to remove the slide, he touches her. As he touches her, she feels coldness and a shock that immediately makes her pull her hand back. This isn't particularly indecipherable in terms of grammar, but the structure steps on itself. Initially telling us what he said creates an image of the character speaking. When we then find out what the narrator was doing at the time, we have to revise that image to include her action. Then, in order to describe what he was doing at the time, she has to repeat, he asked. While it has a bit of a cadence to it, he asked, as he asked, it works against the clarity of the fictive moment by having us revisit it. The three additional bits of information that follow, how his hand felt, the fact that she jerked her hand away, and why she jerked her hand away, increase the clunky feel. And to be fair, I can see why opening with the sound of his voice would be tempting. It's tactile, and in some sense more immediate, since when we read, we're already hearing the author's voice through the words. But in terms of the content, the physical actions are just as, if not more tactile, particularly in romance. They put us in our body rather than our mind. 
If instead we clip an extraneous word here and there, open with the physical action of beginning to remove the slide, then follow with the physical interruption of his hand, and only then go to his words, which explain his interruption, and then end with her ensuing reactions, it creates a more natural flow and eliminates at least some of the doubling back. As I began to remove the slide, his hand caught mine. Do you mind if I look? His fingers were ice cold, like he'd been holding them in a snowdrift. But that wasn't why I jerked my hand away. When he touched me, it stung like an electric current. An improvement? I think so. I could go on, and to be redundant on and on, with similar examples, but ultimately, whether it's sentences, paragraphs, or scenes, editing comes back to the same rules in the same order. Check for typos and grammatical errors, eliminate all three forms of redundancy, eliminate run-on sentences, and structure your sentences, paragraphs, and scenes in ways that A, make for the smoothest read, and B, impel the reader to move forward. I didn't begin my writing career with these rules, and even as they grew in time, they were more about bone memory. It was only through teaching that I needed to really sit down and figure out what they were and how they worked, a process which in itself has, I hope, improved my own writing tremendously. So however you use them, in fits and starts or in their entirety, I hope you find them as useful as I have. The ultimate goal being to bring as much clarity to your work as possible, to keep the focus on the world, not the words. And thanks for watching. And please feel free to post any questions or thoughts. Sometimes I can fight like the devil And sometimes I lay down and die Sometimes I'm just testing the metal Of occasional passers-by If I'm down and out or on the mark Somebody's holding me tight if I'm drowning in my memories I'll bathe it in the light it'll have to do Cause I really hate to choose Sometimes I can stand in a corner And sometimes I run round and round Maybe I'll be screaming my head off Or I won't even make a sound If I'm sticking to the bottom Skimming off the top Sitting in the middle Waiting for my shoe to drop right next to you That's the best that I could do Sometimes I'll be lost in the forest Where no one else can see Won't know whether to follow the map Or to let it follow me do I flow with the momentum or swim against the stream? Argue with reality or dream another dream of me and you? You know I'd really hate to choose.